Let's get scratching. We got an explosive broadcast coming to you. Listen up. Sega games, just keep playing them. Sega! We're back. It's the Sega Bit Swing Report Show. Get ready for Sega news and commentary with George and Barry. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 75 of the Segabit Swing and Report Show. I'm Barry. George will be joining me later in the show to talk Sega news. Uh, for the interview portion, though, I'll be going solo. And joining us tonight, we have a very special guest, Liesl Wilkerson. Hello, Liesl. Hello, Barry. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Let me run through your credits here. You are best known to Sega fans as the voice of many characters, including Sarah Bryant from Virtua Fighter, Gina yes. in Crazy Taxi. Yes, yes. Shenmue 2's, here, here are the names I'm going to butcher, Hong Xiu Ying. Yes. This one's what? easy. Joy. Yep. Yes, Joy. Easiest one there. And then <laughs> Yuan. Correct. Uh, Tekken fans know you as the voice of Nina Williams and Christy Montiero. Correct. You also do voiceover work. Uh, in addition to this, you also do interpreting, producing of various events, and you work as the local correspondent for the Academy Awards, Grammys, Golden Globes, and the Emmys. So I'm sure you've been busy and you will be busy. Mm-hmm. And you also host entertainment programs for Japanese television. Did I miss anything? And I was also in Lost in Translation, the movie, uh, the Academy Award winning movie. I had a question concerning that later on, actually. (laughs) Uh, Oh, okay, okay, yeah, with uh, Bill Murray and with Scarlett Johansson, so yes. Um, Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, and I've done a lot of other uh, voice work, like I was the voice of uh, Panasonic, but you know, these are more commercials, obviously, but I did a voice for Panasonic for four years. Oh, wow. um, I also did the voice for Batsmaru from the Sandio from the Hello Kitty family, oh, um, wow. which was a lot of fun for me because I'm a huge Hello Kitty fan. So that was a lot of fun to be a part of that. But um, yeah, I've been doing it for a very long time. <laughs> oh. uh, well, let's actually let's start at the beginning. You mentioned on your website that you grew up in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Can you tell our listeners what it was like growing up in Japan? And did you have any favorite video games or TV shows as a child that maybe influenced your career? Absolutely. Um, And, you know, going to, because I I go to quite a few anime conventions, and one of the uh, questions, obviously, that comes up to the many voice actors uh, that I'm at the conventions with is, what's your favorite anime? And I always respond by saying I grew up with a lot of old school anime from Japan, like in the late 70s, uh, mid to late 70s. Uh, shows like uh, Candy Candy, which was one, this was my favorite show. Like I, I could not live without the show. And also Attack Number One, which was a show about volleyball. Um, it was an anime show. And, and um, also Ace on which means to go for an ace. And this is a show about uh, tennis. Um, so these uh, three shows were actually very instrumental in um, a lot of choices I made. Like I was in volleyball because of this. I was in, you know, because I, I was such a big fan of the show Attack Number One. I decided to join volleyball, and I was in volleyball for almost twelve years. But um, yeah, it definitely had a very big impact on me, um, as well as radio. For for me, I was a very big radio girl. I loved Wolfman Jack and. Charlie Tuna, and you know, a lot of those old greats that you have, and also Rest in Peace, Casey Kasem. I was a huge fan of the Countdown show, the Top 40 show. Um, And that was absolutely, uh, yeah, I would say that a lot of those shows and people were very, very instrumental in me and in taking me to the path that I'm at right now. Oh, wow. And interesting you should mention those radio greats. I'm actually recording out of Chicago, and I visited the uh, Radio Hall of Fame last weekend. Oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah, Museum of Broadcasting. It's a new building, so if you're ever in Chicago, check it out. I will be there in May. I will make sure to go check it out. Oh, very cool. For a convention or just? Correct. For Anima Central, I'll be there. 
Okay. I might make my way out to that. Yes. That would be great. I would love to see you. Yeah, it'd be cool to meet. Um, so what drew you to the entertainment industry? I know you mentioned a lot of shows, but uh, I mean, you're in the entertainment industry. Was there some sort of like door that opened to you or one role that really started everything? Um, it was really more my love and passion for music. I've always been, um, ever since I was like three years old, uh, music has been probably my biggest passion. Um, and you know, it started off with me as a three year old singing in the yard, according to my mom and dad, I would sing Avis songs. Um, and I would just be singing to whoever, you know, would walk by. Um, and it went from there and it just really grew and, and music was just always such a big part of my life. And I had an opportunity um, when I was 19 to work as a staff for a brand new radio station that was starting up in Japan. And this was a very big deal back then. Um, and so I signed, you know, so I went and had the interview and they wanted to have me as a staff you know, to be a part, kind of, they were looking for a lot of bicultural, bilingual people to staff the radio station because they wanted it to have a very strong international image. And so I started working there. Um, and while I was working, um, within a year, I started to think to myself, you know, I've always loved radio. I wonder if maybe I should just try this thing called radio and see if, it's a good fit for me. And I, so I started, you know, doing, I, I didn't tell anybody and I would just go to this, um, really small radio, like a pirate radio, uh, station. And I would go and I would, you know, start honing my skills and, um, getting to understand, you know, the, how it works and how you do a radio show. And, um, that kind of led to me, later on auditioning and, and becoming a radio, uh, disc jockey. And it, it, everything just kind of took from there. You know, I, I always tell people that, uh, out of everything that I've ever done, I think that radio is probably still my first love. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how everything started. It really did start with my love for radio and music. Oh, wow. And so you, you actually, one of your earliest roles with Gina and Crazy Taxi, was that your first I, voice acting role? No, I had done a lot before then. I mean, this was, uh, keep in mind, this was in an era that where IMDb was not really used. True. And I did. And because I lived in Japan, the, I would say probably 90%, if not 95% of my work um, as a voice actor was done in Japan because I was in radio there for almost 20 years. So I've done so many games, everything from like Sony to Sega to Nam. I mean, you know, you name it, I've done it. Like I've been to the studios. However, just because back then um, they didn't really keep record of a lot of the stuff that was, you know, recorded. And so because of that, I don't know a lot of, yeah, like my former projects, but um Crazy Taxi was a very fun project for me because I worked actually with quite a few people who are fellow DJs. Right. And yeah, so that was a really fun thing to be a part of. Do you do you did you ever know the um, announcer for that? Because I believe he is a DJ in Japan. Yes, Brian. I grew up with him. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and since I was like eight years old, I used to have to take care. I used to have to babysit him because our friends, our families are friends. Yeah. Our parents. And uh, yeah, we grew up together. He was born in the same house that I grew up in. That's crazy. It's so crazy. So he was born there and then his parents moved and they were out of and they moved out of Tokyo. Um, but my parents moved into that house when I think I was like seventh grade or something. And so, um, yeah, we used to talk about that all the time. Cause he's like, man, you're living in the house that was born in. You know? <laughs> so yeah. So we go way back. I know his sister quite well. And, um, yeah, he's still DJing. I think he does a lot of rave parties and what have you. Um, yeah. So I do know Brian very well. Oh, that's very cool. So he's, he's still active in Japan, still working. That's great. Yes, he is. 
Oh, wow. Um, have you ever played Crazy Taxi as Gina? I have. And one of the stories that I love telling, you know, because people always say, when was the first time that you ever heard your voice in a video game? And for me, it was Crazy Taxi. So I was on a date uh, long quite a, quite a while ago. Um, <laughs> and the guy that I, I, I think this is what our second or third date or something. And he was a big gamer. He loved video games. And so we were going to go catch a movie and then, you know, go get something to eat. But before that, he's like, yo, Lise, come on, let's go to this, uh, video game, this game center, because there's this new game that I love. Right. And so I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. Um, and so we go and he starts playing the game and I'm just sitting here watching him, listening to this voice, thinking, wow, that sounds really familiar. And then all of a sudden, it just hit me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's me. And it was just, you know, I said, his name is DJ. And I said, DJ, no, we have to leave. No, 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 no. I was just, I completely freaked out. It was that's so funny. funny. Wow. Yeah. But so that's how I first heard my, so I have played Crazy Taxi. <laughs> them too yeah so, so what's the process like recording for a game like that because i know it's not dialogue heavy do you do you do a lot of riffing or do they have a pretty tight script uh, yeah i um i don't really remember i just remember going to the studio and i i think for crazy taxi one i actually did quite a few of the voices it wasn't just gina i right. i'm credited for Gina, but I just remember having to do all kinds of voices. Um, and yes, they give you a script and then they'll also have you ad lib a little bit, but everything is done solo. So we were all booked at different times. I think they, it was a very low budget project. So I think they had to get everything done in one day. So we all came in at different times um, but yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun. The guy who the, uh, office or the, um, production company that was behind the project, um, he's actually someone that I've worked with in radio for many years. And, um, I consider him to be a senpai, which is kind of like, you know, an older kind of respected colleague. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was his production company that was really in charge of the casting for this, uh, game. So it, it was just a lot of fun because we all knew each other and uh, it was kind of very much of a family atmosphere. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on to your other roles with Sega, mm -hmm. uh, your most popular role has got to be outside of Sarah Bryant, Shenmue 2, just because it's a series where fans are chomping at the bit for a, th a third one, which yeah. is sure to feature your characters. Yes. Um, we've learned from other actors who worked on the game that the English recording sessions were self held at the Sega headquarters. Was this Correct. where you recorded? Yes, I was there. Um, I believe it was in the fall and I had those three parts and then I had a few other parts that were not really credited. Um, and I just remember having to go to the Sega studios for probably a month and a half. Um, off and on. Um, I also at that time was doing a Monday through Friday radio show. So it was a pretty intense fall for me. Um, and there was one time where I went to the studio just because I was using my voice so much. And, um, you know, it was really starting to wear on me a little bit. So I remember going to the studio thinking, ah, man, I feel I kind of feel like my voice is not really caring very well and that it's not, um, it just doesn't have the depth that it should. And when I got by, I thought, well, eh, I can just wing it, you know, it'll be fine. And I remember walking into the studio and we start recording and they're, they immediately say to me, Lisa San, uh, your voice is different. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, no, no. And so we keep trying, but they're like, nope, you have to go home. So I was so devastated because to get to the Sega studios from where I lived or even from the radio station was about an hour, hour mm -hmm. and a half. So it was, you know, it's not like it's right in the middle of downtown Tokyo. You know, it's a little bit kind of on the outskirts. And so I just remember thinking, oh, my gosh. Yeah, 
it was really frustrating. But um, it's funny, though, for me, uh, Shamu has just been this incredible gift that I never I never would have imagined that I would have get so much love from so many people around the world for this game, you know, and um, I think it was just beginning of December that I did uh, an interview with a um, w- with a Canadian production team who are putting together a documentary about Shamu. Hmm. And uh, so they asked if they could interview me and they were interviewing me and I believe Corey Marshall. And uh, so I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and it was just really it's been so wonderful, you know, to see so many people who are just still, you know, so passionate about uh, this game. And um, yeah, I, I just can't say enough good things about Shemu fans like they it's just amazing to me how much they keep, you know, themselves out there. They keep campaigning for Shenmue 3. And I just really hope that something can kind of come up that because I know that they really worked their butt off for so many years to try to get Shenmue 3 happening. So. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, right now, all that I know of is that Sega has, they have a Kickstarter service. They're actually starting to, to I guess, maybe fund certain games. I don't know what they have planned for it. I also know that Yu Suzuki likes the idea of Kickstarter, so we might see something like that. You never know. I think we should. I think now is a great time. I mean, you know, you're seeing a lot of the big studios or, like, a lot of companies buying some of the older games and, you know, like, you see a lot of this love being, you know, given to the some of the older franchises, and I think that Shamu is one that should that deserves, I think that um, Sega should do this just just out of kind of respect to the loyalty of fans. I think that it would be a great idea. And of course, I would be all, I would be totally on board. <laughs> oh, that's good to that's hear. Part of it, yeah. <laughs> uh, it sounds like the recording process for Shenmue is almost night and day with Crazy Taxi. They're having you come back weeks later. And uh, so mm-hmm. it, it was a very different process, I'm assuming. Very We're, different, yes. Were you recording with other actors? Uh, yeah, I did do I did quite a few days with Corey. Um, which was fun. He was he was so wonderful to work with. He was a young boy. He was like what? I think he was like only nineteen or twenty or something. And he came over to Japan and it was really yeah, it was really fun to work with him. Uh Excuse me. I think he's the only one, though, that I worked with. I don't think I worked with any of the other um, actors, even though I know them. Like, right. I know Eric very well, Eric Kelso. And, um, but, yeah, he, I think, probably as far as studio work goes, I think I, I only worked with him. Yeah, that, I think, thinking back, your characters mainly shared screen time with Rio, so that would make yes. sense. Um, Shenmue actors of the past, especially the... Um, first game have said that they were cast not only for their vocal talent, but also oddly for their resemblance to the character. Do you remember this ever coming up during the casting? I don't think it did. No. Hmm. Um, I feel like it did with Tekken and maybe even Virtua Fighter, but I don't really feel like it did with any of my Shenmue characters at all. Um, I feel that... Uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel that way. I, 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 um, I love doing Shamu because, um, I felt that all care, all the characters, uh, brought out a different challenge for me as a voice actor. And, um, so it was really wonderful project to be a part of, but I don't feel that physically, like I really looked like any of the characters. Okay. Was, uh, Yu Suzuki present during the recording? I don't think he was. Okay. Um, I think he was there at the very beginning, but I don't think he was there just because I was going, um, I, I was probably going there like three times a week or something for about a month and a half. Like I was there for quite a long time. I was going back a lot. Um, but yeah, no, I think that he might've been there at the very beginning, but then after that, I don't think he was, I think they really just left it up to, um, the people at the Sega, you know, who do the engineering all the time. And here's the thing is that with Sega back then, um, it was, 
it was also a very wonderful kind of family-like atmosphere because I was probably going to the Sega studios once every two months or something. And so I obviously grew to know the engineers and, you know, they knew my name and it was one of these things where, you know, you, it's like you walk in and you know the kind of talent, you know, that you're dealing with and the people that you're working with. And so it was a very, uh, very, very welcoming atmosphere. Um, it was really wonderful to, I mean, yeah, the only downside of course is the fact that out of the studios, I think that would be the one that's a little bit out there. That yeah. between that one and Sony PlayStation, like those two studios are just like kind of out in the suburbs. But um, yeah. So it's it's not unique to Sega to call people to come in to their their studios. I'm assuming yeah. then that Sony and uh, Namco and other companies would call you in. So with Namco, we would always do it, we would never do it at the Namco headquarters. We always did it at a um, studio that was booked by Namco, well, Namco Bandai. But um, Sony, with Sony PlayStation, we would do it at their studios, usually. Um, and yeah, with Sega, it was always done in-house. They would always have their own engineering people team take care of it and we would always use the studios in sega i had some questions about some of your characters um i don't know how versed you are in their uh histories or anything i'm not getting into backstory so much as uh uh well for example the character yuan is uh unique in that in the original japanese version of the game she was voiced by a man intended to be a transvestite yes uh this did not carry over to the english version Yes. And they altered any mention of the uh, of being a man to being a woman. Were, so you yes. were aware of this. Were you aware of this at Absolutely. the time? In fact, and I actually bring this up, and I, I think I brought this up actually at the uh, Shemu documentary that I did. But um, this was actually a very, very deliberate thing. So back then, and we spent, uh, I don't know, we must have spent a couple hours trying to figure out a voice uh, for Yuan. So they, you know, when we, when we first started doing the Yuan voice, uh, I remember um, them telling me, okay, so the character is a transvestite. However, we do not want to anger any of our, any of our U.S. fans. And so we want to make the voice we want to make it a very androgynous character. It's not a girl. It's very hard to tell whether it's a girl or a boy or, and so they wanted to make, and so the voice as well, like they, they, I went through quite a few voices um, and, you know, they're like, give, you know, give us a few voices and we'll figure out and we'll let you know what we want from you on. Um, and I remember uh, at that time, this was, I don't remember when it was, but it was right during when Sex in the City was really big, you know, worldwide, and every girl was watching Sex in the City. And, yeah. um, I was I was also watching the show, and I remember my, one of my favorite characters was Kim Cattrall, and for the, and I ended up kind of channeling her and the way she speaks, not necessarily her tone as much as kind of the way she speaks a little bit. I, I channeled that a little bit when I came up with a Yuan voice that we ended up using. So a lot of times when I was speaking and speaking in the Yuan, you know, and, and doing all the lines and everything, I would kind of, I would do her gestures in the studio um, so I have to say that honestly, that was probably one of the funnest characters to do. I really, really enjoyed doing you on. Oops, sorry. I really okay. enjoyed doing you on. Yeah. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but like, uh, vocally, like how, how did you get that voice? Like, can I hear an example of it? I haven't played the English version in probably yeah. about six years. I, yeah, I think it would be something like, well, you know, it's how it goes. I think so. Okay. And so she's very, you know, a little bit kind of sexy, kind of, but also a little bit, um, yeah. But I, I think that was kind of the tone of voice that I was um, 
trying I was kind of channeling during oh, wow. that. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, even though they they did change the mentions, that it wasn't a complete uh, overhaul of the character internally. Uh, yeah. The back. It was more like. Um, you know, they don't say anything then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And it was, and I think that, um, it was something that they really, really thought about for a very long time, but they just didn't really, they weren't really sure. Like, you know, cause I think in, in many, sometimes in many ways, especially when it comes to video games and anime and such, um, that the Japanese almost think that of the Americans is like a little bit prudish, you know, like not prudish, but you know what I mean? Like we're like, sometimes there's this puritanical part of our culture that we have that intimidates them a little bit. And so they don't want to, and also they don't want to ruffle any feathers and they don't want to be too controversial. And so there's a lot of that that kind of came into play, but then they also wanted to keep the authenticity of the game. And so there was this, you know, back and forth that went on for quite a while. Hmm, interesting. And nowadays with the Grand Theft Auto games, I mean, yes. they're going <laughs> above and game. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, it would be interesting to see if, um, if the character ever returns, if they would just go and use the original backstory <laughs> now that, uh, you know, yeah. Cause now things are so much more out in the open and it's so much more, I believe that, you know, of course, there's still a lot of problems in society with people, you know, accepting uh, people that are different, what have you. But um, I would hope that they would, that they would. I would hope that they would go to the original backstory because I think that would be really cool. Yeah, definitely a unique uh, villain in the series. Yes. Um, was it ever mentioned to you the, if the characters would return in future games, or did you get any hints at their uh, backstories? Not at all. No. No. Yeah. I can imagine they're they're pretty tight lipped when it comes to Shenmue Three. Yes, I had to ask them. They are. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've also played Sarah Bryant in the Virtua Fighter series. Uh, as well as playing uh, many roles in other fighting games, can you describe the process of recording a fighting game compared to something like Shenmue? Um, well, with a fighting game, so first of all, like the Virtua Fighter, the Tekkens, even like a game like Rumble Roses, like all those rose, all those games that I did, usually with those, you only are allotted a three to four hour period to do your work. So I feel that it's almost more, it's a lot more intense. You know, so you're so you get to the studio and then you meet with the director and they go over what they're looking for, the vision they have for the game and what they're looking for in your character. And then you go into the studio and then there's this whole dance that is involved with, yeah, OK, I like that voice, but I want a little bit lower or, you know, so you you figure out the sweet spot. You give them the voice that they want and then you just go bam, 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 and you just knock it out. So with that, it's a lot more intense. Whereas with Shamu, um, I was there. I would, you know, it was like eight hour days. And so I would go in and I would record the whole day. Um, so it was almost like I felt like I was a, a staff or employee of Sega for about a month and a half. I mean, you know, and, um, and then also just because, of course, there – are so many more battle cries that come into play, you know, with, um, especially with like the, you know, Nina's and Christie's and what have you. And so, um, yeah. So I, I think that the whole process is just more expedited yeah. when it's a fighting game, like Virtua Fighter or Tekken. So would you say because of that fast process, do you, do you ever feel like you're not as, uh, in tune with the characters as you would like say uh an action adventure game like Shenmue like or is there a fighting game character that you feel most closest to I know yeah. they they don't have a lot of characters sometimes but sometimes they do yeah I think um and and actually I do get this question a lot at anime conventions they'll say which which character do you find you most resemble and I always tell them that it's for me it's Nina Williams um I feel that 
And then, you know, it, it may be in some ways, I would also say Sarah Bryant as well, because I like the fact that she's really sassy. I like that attitude kind of that she has. Um, but I think with Nina, I, I, I feel that she comes across as a very in control, uh, part of my French, badass biatch, you know, <laughs> like she is just a, like she's this cold blooded assassin, right? So she's a very efficient fighter and yet she has this weakness, which tends to be her sister and, so you see like the vulnerability as well with her character. And I really like that. And I can really relate in many ways, I think to the, uh, Nina Williams character. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would have to say that I do relate a lot to her and I like the complexity of her, of her character Mm -hmm. a lot. Um, so yeah, that's what I would probably say. Interesting. Um, in regards to uh, the Virtua Fighter games, the the last one came out quite a while ago, but they have been doing a lot of updates. There's also been uh, her reappearance as a cameo in Dead or Alive 5. Yeah. Um, were you called back to the studio for any of these updates or cameos? No. What they did is they used the voices, the um, tracks that they already had for me, and they did call me and and ask to get to get my permission, and you know all that was done, but. Um, I did not actually physically go back into the studio to do anything. Okay. And, you know, Virtua Fighter 5, they are all but complete with the uh, updates to it. Are you ready for a sixth game? Oh, I would totally be ready for a sixth game. Of course. Nice. (laughs) I had to ask. Um, And you actually, you already covered the question of which one do you feel you most relate to, so I can skip that one. Um, Let's talk about some non-Sega stuff. Uh, okay. tell, you mentioned your work on Lost in Translation. Can you tell us what it was like on set, uh, how long you were on set, and how awesome Bill Murray is? Bill Murray is superbly awesome. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely awesome. Um, he was really wonderful to work with. My scenes were with him. So, um, And what was really interesting uh, you know, kind of the backstory behind the movie is this Lost in Translation film is loosely based on Sofia Coppola's life, right? So she right. used to be married to Spike Jones, and Spike Jones would come to Japan all the time and get paid an enormous amount of money to, you know, film these really big music videos for Japanese artists or to like film these really big commercials. And so she was always tagging along and going with him to Japan. Well, I actually met her during that period in her life. Um, So this would have been about 10 years prior to the filming of Lost in Translation, Um, which is, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of almost this, fun, like, you know, full circle thing where I got to meet her. And honestly, my first impression was I didn't really like her very much. Um, I thought, you know, she was kind of like, hey, hi, you know. Um, And I just remember thinking to myself, I was I was actually taping a interview with a with a band by the name of Sonic Youth. Um, they were in Japan and they're, they're the UK kind of grunge rock band and they were there to, to promote their 12th album as well as, as doing some concert dates. And so we were having this sit down TV interview with them and I was just, I was just getting ready to start the interview when all of a sudden Sofia Coppola just comes into the suite of the hotel that we're in and She's like, hi, guys, I don't have anything to do, so can I just hang out with you, kind of thing. And I looked over, and I was like, who the heck is this that they think that they can just, like, you know, barge in, and I'm there getting ready to do the interview. So, anyway, I (laughs) know, and she was was just like, ah, she was like, she kept... Every time that we had to, like, you know, um, stop the camera for lights or something, she would start asking them questions. I mean, she was completely destroying my synergy, right, that I was trying to get going with the band. And um, so needless to say, I was not a big fan. Well, I didn't know who she was, right? And so we're leaving the hotel, and I turned to one of my TV 
uh, to the cameraman. And I was like, who is, who was that? And they're like, oh, Lisa-san, that was Sofia Coppola-san. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay. And then fast forward 10 years later, and I get this audition to go do a movie. And I was just told it's a new Bill Murray movie. That was all I was told. Right. And they're doing a lot of cast. There were a few parts that they were casting locally. It's an independent feature. And I was given no more information. None of us were. So we show up. I go to the audition. I'm there. And it's a total cattle call. So I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to get this, whatever, you know. And, and then um, And then I'm getting ready to leave. They take some pictures of me. They're like, um, I was told to dress in a business suit. So I wore like a pantsuit. And as I'm leaving and heading out the door, someone taps me on the shoulder and they say, uh, excuse me, can we get more, a few more pictures of you? I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. So they kind of took me to the side. And then all of a sudden, out of the shadows, I look and see Sophia Coppola. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, oh, we meet again. You know, and and yeah. then come to you know, and then I found out that I got the film. So I thought to myself, this will be very interesting because the only time that I really had any interaction with her was you know in that hotel suite, and it was not all good. So um, I was very interested to see how everything would be on set. But she was one; of, she was incredibly gracious. She was really wonderful to work with. Um, Bill Murray was wonderful to work with as well. And, uh, you know, they, they filmed that movie in two and a half weeks, I believe in Tokyo. So they were on a very tight schedule. Um, and it was wow. just, yeah, it was a really, really tough, uh, film, you know, for them. I, wow, that, that tight schedule does not come across. It's a very kind of sleepy film. Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah, which wow. I think, you know, kind of is really, you know, that is just to show, you know, I think that that's to Sophia Coppola's credit. You know, I think that on set, I noticed that she was incredibly um, she was. Yeah, she was really, really wonderful to work with. I mean, she was not, you know, sometimes you'll get directors and they're very moody um, and they can really change the mood of the whole set because they might be happy and then everyone's happy. They're really, you know, upset or angry and then everyone is tense. Right. But with her, she's just very even keeled um, on set. And so it was a really comfortable environment. And um, even a few of the times that I was there and maybe I'd be waiting for a scene, but Bill Murray would go over to Sofia Coppola and she'd be like, yeah, you know, maybe we should do it this way. And it was just a very interactive set. Like mm -hmm. she's very much about getting feedback. It seems like from her actors. And when, you know, I did my scene, she also told me at the very beginning, she's like, you know, I wrote down your lines. However, this is just what I, I all I want is the, I want the content to be there, but it does not have to be. You don't have to go by word by word. Do what comes naturally. So I'm like, okay, no problem. And it was yeah, it was a really really cool experience for me. Oh, that's that's a really cool story. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, sure. That's really neat. Uh, you also do correspondence work and you host uh, entertainment programs for Japanese TV. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I've done everything from. You know, the L.A. Hollywood gossip, uh, you know, for various Japanese TV stations and radio stations. And, um, you know, I mean, usually it tends to be more red carpet events um, for, a, for a while. And this actually this uh, corner that I was doing just ended um, the show ended. But for probably in a year and a half or maybe two years, I was doing a five minute segment where I would come up with a interesting topic. It could be anything from a new restaurant or a new trend or a new movie or, you know, whatever, but it was LA centric because they wanted to have it about LA life. And so I would write the script and then we would tape it over um, Skype 
you know, and they would be, they would call me from the Tokyo, from the radio station in Tokyo. And yeah, and then we would record it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, Because the Japanese, of course, are very much into what's going on here in the States. So they're always curious about things. And, um, and, you know, like the Academy Awards, the Grammys are very big events in Japan as well. So of those course. are always like newsworthy events that they want to know about. So, yeah. So I, I guess to close things out, I wanted to ask you, what, what sort of advice would you give to aspiring voice actors, people who want to get into radio or correspondence work? I know they're very different lines of work, mm-hmm. but uh, is there any advice that you'd want to? Yeah, give? I think for me, um, probably the biggest um, piece of advice I would give is because, you know, you nowadays it seems like there are a lot of people who want to be voice actors. And I think that that's really wonderful and I think it's great. The only problem is that it, it's a very, very competitive field. Um, so to actually be able to make your living strictly off of voice work nowadays is a very, very, very tough thing to do. Um, so if you are going to go down that path, then I think you need to really, really make sure that that's what you want to do because you, you're going to, you're going to be looking at things long term, you know, unless you're extremely lucky and you're like the 1% who just happens to be at the right place at the right time, chances are it's going to take quite a while for you know you to make enough money or to get enough jobs to where this is all you know you you just make a living off of voice work another thing that i would probably recommend is making sure that you're very versatile as a talent i know a lot of people um that i run into they say well i only want to do anime and video games and I think that that's great to, to get into those, you know, sectors of the voiceover industry. However, there's a lot more work in other areas as well, you know, like commercials or um, or even like, you know, in, or educational stuff as well. You know, or like I did like I, I did GPS systems like I've done anything and everything. And I think that it's really important to kind of reach out and try as much as you can, because no matter what, it will help and build your experience. And you just never know. I think with the entertainment industry, it's all about who you know, and you might work with someone on a job where you don't get paid anything, but that person might remember you and come back a few years later and give you you know, the gig of your life. So it's one of those things where I would, I always tell people never say never, you know, you should always be a work in progress. You should always be, you know, striving to do better or striving to learn. And you should always, you know, like be up for new opportunities and challenges and don't like poo poo them and say, Oh no, that's beneath me. Or, you know, I mean, of course you also have to have the amount of respect for yourself and, you know, never, you know, don't do something that you will like morally not be comfortable with or, you know, I mean, there, there's of right. course, obviously everyone has a certain line that, you know, they don't want to, they're like, no, this is as far as I will go. And this goes with, you know, financially as well. Like you don't want to always be selling yourself short and say, yeah, I'll do it for free all the time, you know. But I do think that you should, you know, you should always, you know, try to do some of those really independent, even if it's a no budget gig, you know, if you think it's going to help you in your growing process. And I think it's really important to do. That's awesome advice. And where can fans find you in the next uh six, eight, 12 months, uh, whatever, uh, convention plans you may have. Yes. Um, well, I am headed to Europe, um, in two days. I'm going to be going to Amsterdam, actually Rotterdam, uh, in Netherlands, uh, for the Tsunakan. And then the week after that, I will be in Copenhagen in Denmark for the J-pop con, Wow. Um, and then I will be coming back to the States and in March I will be at Kawaii Con in Hawaii. Um, 
April. I I've got quite a few <laughs> conventions lined up. I don't remember, but I mean, I I try to um, update my schedule on AnimeCons.com as much as possible. But I will also be going to Anime Central in May, and I will be over at Anime Expo in July. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably be, I don't know, all over the place. And I'm, oh, and for Tekken fans, they will be happy to know that in, in October, I will be going to Ireland. Ooh. Yes, the home of Nina Williams. Wow, you're quite the globetrotter. I know, I'm trying. <laughs> Oh, wow. And uh, fans can find you on Twitter. Your uh, handle, it's Liesl Weapon. Yes, correct. And also Facebook. So I'm very and active Facebook. on social media, or I try to be. So, yes, absolutely. And, you know, sometimes people are like, well, but, you know, a lot of people have fan pages and they don't really interact with. But I interact all the time with people on Facebook. So I'm very actively involved on both Twitter and Facebook. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely share both those out uh, after the show is posted for everyone to uh, find you on the social networks. Um, awesome. And Liesl, I just wanted to thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. If you just want to stay on for a few minutes after we uh, after we go off air, um, I said a few extra questions. But thank you so much for chatting with us, yeah, no, with I'm me, not. using the royal we, us. Uh, <laughs> Really awesome stories, lots of really cool Shenmue info and uh, voice acting in general, and I love that Lost in Translation story. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Calling all units. We need backup. It's the sake of its submission report show. Get ready. You'll never meet anyone on the likes of her. Joining me right now, I have George back in the uh, the saddle. George, thanks for joining me on the 75th show. I'm glad to be here. You reckon like I'm like like, like I'm you're the guest. Special, well, well, you are. The, I'm ready. Hey, you're you're the special guest. It's uh, the the site's five years old now. We're reaching our 75th episode. You're the the you were on the very first one. You're the one to last the longest on the shows. Well, yeah. I mean. Do we really want to hear uh, Sharky and Aki all the time? No, we don't. Guys? I can't even understand their language. I'm saying, man. It's British English. English. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, hey, uh, what do you say we talk about some news? We haven't done that in a while. Let's talk about some news. What's, uh, what sort of news we got? We got some pretty big news here, actually. Sega of America is moving. Uh, several uh, people are being laid off. In fact, several hundred people are being la- laid off, both in America and Japan. Uh, wh- what sort of? I mean, you know, we're we're coming to this a little late, at least with the podcast. But I feel like it's a uh, it's a good time to come at it, just because I think I think a lot of people were misreading the news. Like, what sort of things were you hearing online? You don't have to name names of certain fan sites. Oh, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna name names of fan sites. I think it was even worse with some professional sites were posting stuff like this, like. Uh, I'm not going to say the site's name. There's a British outlet that pretty much put on the title that, oh, Sega is shutting down and going out of business, basically. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's false. But, um, I mean, there's clickbait articles. It's kind of sad that people didn't just sit down and read the PDF that they released. Because if people think 300 people are employed by Sega and then that's it, I mean, that's pretty stupid. Yeah. And, I mean, let's let's actually do that instead of – Going from uh, you know conjecture and reading Twitter posts from uh, from people who are supposedly in the know, they sent out a three page uh, uh, PDF which mm-hmm. was dated January thirtieth, twenty fifteen. I, I mean, there's a lot of Lego mumbo jumbo, lots of addresses, names, but really, um, uh, let's let's read through it. I think we have the time. There's not that much text, so let's just read through it, and you can stop me if something is uh, is uh, catches your eye. So they okay. said, it is hereby notified that Sega Sammy Holdings Incorporated, I like this part, the company, in quotes, has determined at its board of directors meeting held on January 30th to implement measures for structure reform in Sega Corporation. So this is something that um, I guess they've been mulling over, but they, they made the decision on the 30th. A bunch of guys gathered around a table uh, on atop a giant tower in Japan. Um, called the company. Yeah, called the company. Called the company. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what 
basically implementation of group structure reform. This is how they break it down. The company, which is Sega Sammy Holdings, established the Group Structure Reform Division on May 9, 2014, and has held discussions to review the earnings structure of the entire group from mid to long term point of view. It's interesting here because it's showing that this wasn't a snap decision. They had a team assembled that was looking at Sega of America, Sega of Japan, Sega of Europe as early as May 9th. Um, yeah. And what I find interesting about that is I know Sonic Boom, the game, was a critical disappointment. And I'm, I'm sure it played some part, but I don't think it was the only I'm pretty, thing. I'm pretty – well, no, no. But I um, I mean I don't want to get into the whole Sega of America coming to this kind of uh, thing, but – yeah, it, Sonic. I think Sonic Boom was just the the camel that broke the back. Yeah. I mean, didn't they announce it as a, one of the the biggest uh, franchise launches launch in like uh, Sega West history or something like? It, Sega of America history for sure. They yeah. had a uh, remember they we didn't get the invite, but it was in New York and it was a reveal of the the franchise. This was even before a game was revealed. They were talking about uh, toys, TV show. I don't. I don't think a game was even mentioned. Maybe no. The game was mentioned at this time. This is when the game was really revealed. But before that, it was. Uh, yeah, but I mean, um, they did have between uh, you know November and January. They did have three months to assess if Sonic Boom was a uh, hit or not. So I think it. I guess I'll, I'll change my answer. It did impact it a bit, but this sh- shows that from at least May onwards, they were looking at. Other things besides Sonic Boom. Yes. Um, and this is interesting, too. The group, it says here, the group announced on October 31st three initiatives, restructuring into three business groups, two, initiatives to drastically improve profitability, and three, the appointment of personnel in charge of structure reform in Sega, and has developed a structure to enable investment of management resources in growth areas. I, I'm glad I, I don't work in this industry because uh, I can't understand half of this, but which include new fields such as digital games and res- resort business while addressing issues in existing businesses. And this is interesting because this predates the sonic boom right here, October 31st. These initiatives yeah. were put into place. Um, so digital games were definitely, even before sonic boom, were even, focused. Even, uh, even into the 2012, the little uh, restructure, they, that was always going to be a focus, digital titles. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and I mean... Uh, We can get into that, too. I want to get through this part. It says, as part of these measures, Sega has positioned digital games centered around smartphone and PC online gaming as a growth area. So they looked at what they've been doing, and they said PC and online gaming is working, and it has been. They've been doing pretty well with it the past few years, Um, and they determined to implement the following measures in order to constantly post profits by improving management efficiency while promptly promoting redistribution of management resources. Whew. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, Save America has some really uh, mm, bad management yeah. on some stuff. I mean, I don't want to be like, I, I don't want to be like, you know, fucking couch judging them, you know, like yeah. I'm on my couch and I'm judging you. you and we should up. make it clear that out the people we interact with at Sega of America are not the decision makers. No, I'm they, no, no. They make some great decisions in terms of, you know, uh, what they're given. But they, you know, for example, the community team, they're not calling the shots on if we should see a Shenmue remastered or if we should see yeah. a Sonic 3 remastered. They're, they're not sitting in some chair petting a cat going, more Sonic, cancel Shimmy 3. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. But the, the people that are managing, I mean... Somebody has to take responsibility. I mean, like, it just seems like Sega America, whoever's managing the American studios on making games, they just kind of don't give a shit. I mean, like, we had the whole alien colonial marines, and then it's like they're going to gain suit for it. It's like, it just, it was just like a big ball of shit just, like, fell on top of that division only. Like, yeah. And then, like, and then Sega Europe came and did isolation with, a, with an in-house team and knocked it out of the park. Here, answer this. What was the last Sega of America package title you enjoyed? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I can't even think of one. <laughs> the, the Marvel games? No. 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 Golden Compass? 
No. Daisy I didn't Fuentes that one. Pilates. That one was pretty good. I got to admit, that one was uh, it had a good box art. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Um, maybe uh, Alpha Protocol, but would that even be them? Yeah, that was British, wasn't it? I don't know. Obsidian made it. I think they're Canadian. Close enough. Yeah, maybe. But even then, that was. I'm talking about. Well, Alpha Protocol was uh, internally funded, but externally developed. Correct. It, it was a yeah, collaboration. Yeah. I'd say Alpha yeah. Protocol. Yeah. And it wasn't even Korea. It wasn't, and it had way mis- mismanagement. What I've heard, it was like, I remember Sega randomly like, uh, like advertising it in magazines. Yeah. Like a month it was supposed to come out, like two months before it came out. And then randomly they were like, yo, it's delayed for another year. It's like, oh, so you spent all this money on advertising. That's nice. Located so, in California, by the way. So most definitely a Sega America venture. Yeah. So they were advertising this game and delaying it and delaying it, and then they finally came out and it was still not, you know, a complete game. Yeah. It was still, you could tell that it needed work. So we're looking at five years ago, and even then the game wasn't great. wasn't good. Yeah, even then it had issues. Yeah. So, I mean, am I surprised that they're they're Sega Japan and Europe are like, I mean, well, Sega Japan really, Mm -hmm. telling them like, you know what, I think it's enough with you with the package titles. We, We tried, I mean... They gave them a lot of money on Sonic Boom to launch that. Yeah. And in the, in the games were blunt. I mean, I mean they weren't great. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and you know, speaking of Sonic Boom, it's weird too because like, uh, you know, you said like, or I said, what's uh, the last Sega America game you enjoyed? Like maybe Alpha Protocol 2010. I wasn't playing it at that time. I played it probably a year or two ago. It's all right. Sonic Boom. It's all right. It's probably, but yeah, I, I haven't enjoyed a Sega of America game in a long time. It hurts to say that, but I haven't. And people are all like freaking out, but like, there's no more package. It's all digital. No, but now, now let's now let's turn back a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, how? What's the last digital title you enjoyed from Sega of America? I mean, and then you'll probably be able to name a few, you know. So. Yeah, I think it's it's for the best. They were really shining through. I mean, they had that Sonic Dash game with Harlight Studio. They had a th- there's a few things that I think they should uh you know look into. But so far, I mean, their digital stuff was good, and if it means bringing games like Pers- uh, Fantasy Star Online too, hopefully sometime. Yeah, to be fair, nice. Hard Hardlight was uh, UK as well. So I mean, even if it was a digital title, and Crazy Taxi City Rush too. Uh, there hasn't, yeah. there hasn't been much quality output from Sega of America. Um, no. They've, they've been handling some pretty great Japanese and uh, uh, British games or English, UK games. But, um, yeah. Frankly, frankly, I think uh, this is a long time coming for them, and I'm surprised it, ha- it hasn't happened sooner. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what is your opinion on that? Well, you know, I... I I've worked in, uh, I work in, you know, like a, a corporate structured world, and I know as a fact that when they make big decisions, it takes a long time to carry things out. Like you'll, you might see one group be affected, and maybe a year later, it wouldn't be until the next group was. Um, so I'm, we we did see Sega Europe get impacted by such changes uh, quite a while ago. Um. I'd say you mentioned, you know, this is Japan making this decision. The fact that Sega Europe is almost non-existent from this uh, PDF says something about their what they've been doing right, you know. Oh, oh yeah, they they've got franchises right now making money. I mean, they got a uh, Creative Assembly doing those Total War games, always top, and then they got the Sports Interactive. I know Sega Sega fans don't like them, but Sports Interactive, their Football Manager series is always on the top of the charts in Steam. Yeah. And uh yeah. So they they got some stuff going on over there for them. They could literally just sit back and put it on auto control and they had teams to bring in the cash. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's it's like Disney with their Marvel and Star Wars brands. You don't look at Marvel or Star Wars and say, "Oh, that's a Disney. That's a Disney movie." But it's making money for Disney, you know. <laughs> you could hate Disney yeah. and you have to go see the latest Avengers movie and you're you're putting money in their pockets. So same thing with Creative Assembly or with uh, Sports Interactive, you know, you might 
it, it might be the other way around too. People are like, oh, Sega's dead. Oh, look, Football Manager. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and then now the uh, now Sega Japan has the Persona series. So. That's true. Atlas as well. Yeah, making Sega money too. So. You know, in the perfect world, Sega would not be uh, hurting in any area. Unfortunately, they are, and that area was um, Sega of America's packaged output. Not not the games that they were packaging that were coming from overseas, but their own projects. I mean, even even their overseas stuff, I mean, I think somebody was saying that, like, uh, Sega Isolation sold way less in America than they did in Europe. I don't know. I, don't, I never saw numbers for the American uh, side, but mm. I, I wouldn't even be surprised. But I think there's a there's a really weird lack of like advertising, I guess, or marketing on the Sega America side. Like for sure, there's only so much you could do online. So I don't know. I think there there has to be some sort of like change, I guess. I don't know how Sega Europe does it. Well, let's let's read what those those uh, changes they're going to be making are. It says details of measures for structure reform. A. Enhancing efficiency, enhancing efficiency in domestic businesses. Sega will review its business structures mainly in amusement amusement businesses and will narrow down product lineup and withdraw or consolidate and downsize some of the services. So this is the Japan side, I'm assuming, right? Uh, I'm assuming it's going to probably be worldwide. I mean, yeah. I think the amusement business is still in America, and I, if what I heard, it's really, really small. You drove by there. I did. Business. I actually, I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast. I, I drove by uh, the old Sega Amusements building, and it was uh, occupied by someone else. So I looked on a Arcade Heroes site uh, on a ArcadeHeroes.com post, and they said that they actually moved and they went under a new game name, uh, Play It Amusements, but they are fully owned by Sega. I drove by that. It's very tiny. Um, exactly. I still yeah. I still want to visit it, <laughs> but you know it'd be like one it would be like one lady it would be like in Men in Black where you walk in and it's just a guy sitting on a stool and you're like so I'm working here yeah. and then you go in and there's nothing in the building just empty yeah <laughs> um, it's also that Sega Japan was actually releasing like some really huge ridiculous cabinets yeah. like and uh, I think there was that. Uh, uh, they posted it on the forum, somebody, about uh, Virtual Fighter 6. Yeah. Uh, they had an interview with AM2, and they talked about uh, the future of arcades. And they said uh, that the arcade business, you, you have to go the cheapest, basically, now for a cabinet. It's not like back in the 80s when they could make these ridiculous cabinets for OutRun and just make money out of it. Arcade operate. I mean, people that buy arcades, for, you know, they want the the basic, you know, two jo- I mean, the joystick and and the buttons. Yeah. So I mean, it still looks good for Virtual Fighter. I mean, because it's not one of those games that you need a, a gimmick get cabinet. Yeah. But uh, it just, I just think the whole, I, the whole, the whole time, the whole fucking past of gimmick arcades is done. And it's a shame, but you know I'm gonna play the uh, the fanboy card and defend Sega in that it's not their fault. It's the it's the market. People don't go to arcades anymore to ride big rides. They either go to amusement parks or they stay at home and play the latest next gen consoles. Um, yeah. You can't. I mean, and this kind of goes with the people wanting another Sega console too. Sega will lose money if they release a new console. Sega will probably go under if they release a new console. Same thing. If they can't, yeah. If they can't, make, oh sorry, go on. Oh, I was going to say same thing goes for these riding games. You know, you're not going to see uh, as much as I'd love to see it. You're not going to see Space Harrier, you know, like 2099, the sequel in a giant riding cabinet. It'll make them go bankrupt. No one will buy it. They can make them, and it'll make them look awesome. It'll be, oh my god, look at this news post on on Sega Bits. There's a cool new riding cabinet, and then you know, you look at people who run arcades. And they're going to be looking at those things and go, fuck no, I'm not dropping $4,000 or however much it costs. It's probably way more than oh, that. Fuck, but, yeah, uh, yeah, it's probably 10000 I don't know. But uh, it, it, exactly. And it's like, oh, and then just to make a profit, I have to charge a dollar plus. And who's going to pay that much money to sit on an arcade cabinet and lose real quickly on a hard game? You know, in the ideal world, Sega would be making money and they would be impressing us. However... Right now, they're they're not making money in some areas, and to be fair, they're also not really impressing us in a lot of areas. Um, however, I will say that you know, throw consoles and new arcade cabinets out the window. Well, don't do that physically because you know you should keep those things. But um, 
there's they've made some pretty great decisions digitally recently. The 3D classics are awesome. We had Valkyria Chronicles, and this year alone we're having uh, Yakuza Five. We're having the uh, Fighter Fighting Climax, and um, and that one's getting a physical release too. Yeah, in America at least. But yeah, which is yeah. even funnier. You're like in America where they're scaling back. It was like two days before they announced this whole thing, and everybody's like, no more package games. I'm like, they just announced it two days ago. Shut up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here, let's go through this next bit here. This is uh, also interesting. Uh, so these are details of measures for restructure reform. Uh, voluntary retirement will be solicited in the affirmated businesses to be withdrawn or consolidated or downsized. So referring to SAG of America and the uh, arcade divisions. Um, Well, at the same time, personnel will be repositioned in digital games in growth areas of group, mainly as development personnel, in order to establish a structure which can be constantly generating profits. The purpose of these measures is to improve the business efficiency of the group. Um, So basically what this is saying is people who are no longer needed are going to be asked to leave. They're not being... Uh, Well, they are being – it says they're being downsized, but some people will be asked to take a voluntary retirement, which is a fancy way of saying fired. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But they said at the same time, personnel will be repositioned in digital games. So you might have someone who does work with, um, you know, packaged titles, but now they're saying to them the work you do also, you know, applies to digital games. But maybe they're – you know, I don't know – who exactly is employed at Sega of America, what roles they have. But let's say, for example, there's someone who deals with uh, talking with the big box stores about stocking their games. They might lose their job. Yeah, I yeah. see that. Um, uh, anything else you wanted to mention about that bit? I mean, I, I don't – it feels you know sad for me to mention certain people, but you know, like producers that we know from Sega of America, they'll, they have probably been asked to leave just because – there are no major titles for them to produce now because Sega will not be doing Sega of America will not be doing these packaged games, which again, so people don't misconstrue what we're saying. These are like the golden compasses, the, the Sonic booms, the Marvel titles, like, like we said, name a packaged Sega of America title. Yeah, that was, I mean, I I feel, I I feel really bad about saying that. Um, Shinobi 3d, that was good. What? Oh, yeah, there you go. That's actually a good game, yeah. Shinobi 3DS. And it's, it's just freaking hard, man. Yeah, that's true. And it, they did change the game from the original. And I don't know if it's in a bad way. It's in a different way. Yeah. And it's, but it's not like... It's not like... Um, it's like every enemy could kill you in that game. Yeah. No matter what the enemy is. <laughs> it's easier it's than nice. Shinobi on PS2, though. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, let's see, the the third point they mention here, and then this is getting to the end of it, basically. Um, Local organizations managing packaged game software in Western markets will be streamlined. In the U.S., Sega of America, Inc., based in San Francisco, will be relocated to Southern California by this summer, and, and its existing office in San Francisco will be closed thereafter, which results in reducing fixed expensive expenses mainly in corporate functions. In addition, the Sonic and merchandising businesses will be reinforced to establish a structure which can generate stable profits. This is probably the most interesting one to me. Yeah, I think this is one that I've actually been debating online with people. But basically, I don't think people... I, a lot of people have changed... Um, that word, reinforced, has been... Um, I mean, changed by people, depending on who you ask what they think or reinforced means. Some people say things that it means that they're going to, like, r- shove more Sonic games down our throat. Some other people think that it's, uh, I don't even know what people, some other people think. Most people I've seen think that it's, that means more Sonic games. Personally, reinforced to me means they're going to be taking a step back and trying to, I guess, re, I mean, well, bring out more Sonic games, but, like, and merchandise, but try to do a, I guess, better job for the brand name. I mean, I would assume that some Sonic Boom wasn't that great for the brand name of Sonic. No, no. I mean, I could be, I could be wrong on this. Uh, no, I'd, I'd agree with you. And um, just you know, going through this, uh, you know, they they are moving them physically, which is a pretty big move. But um, 
they mentioned that one of the reasons for this move, well, s- some of the reasons here are streamlining the process of managing package game software. So clearly, you know, people say, oh, Sega's done. Sega of America, we're not going to see any more physical games. Streamlining does not, in nowhere does streamlining mean canceling. It means simplifying, meaning the process was probably overly complicated. There may have been too many people under employment of Sega of America than there needed to be, given they only re- released, what, like two or three boxed games last year. Yeah, they've been cutting down on boxed games. I mean, they used to do, like, a billion games mm-hmm. a year. So, so yeah, they've cut down a lot on box games. It could have been trimming the fat in that regard, and streamlining also could mean that they might be looking to use external, um, you know, uh, ho- however the process works, but maybe external groups, external external people to handle these things. What what I find interesting is that um, they're moving them to Southern California, which people have told me, oh, it's a big place, Barry. You know, you can't pinpoint where they're going to go, but there are two very important places in Southern California right now for Sega Sammy. There is Atlas USA, and there is Hollywood, which they uh, have stated back in December that they are going to start um, utilizing old IP for TV, movie, and merchandising efforts. Um, So, you know, Mm -hmm. to, to move Sega of America, you know, it is, it is heartbreaking from the nostalgic standpoint but they say here, you know, it's going to be reducing fixed expenses. I hear that rent is pretty crazy out there. I'm not trying to, uh, you know. San Francisco kind of fucking sucks, I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> That's your one. No, I had a. No, no, I'm just joking. I, it's, I mean, it's cool. It's just sections of San Francisco are kind of trashy. Yeah. But, I mean, it's every city is like that. I visited the offices, too, and the Sega of America offices, and they, they were nice. Um, but they definitely felt like they were in a building that they once occupied much more of, and they have since... Uh, scaled down it it felt like you know they the whole building i felt like was going to be there as i walked in it was kind of like first floor not so much second floor some shipping receiving kind of things third floor uh sag of america you know um yeah so you know it, it, uh, i guess i equated this before um i think like in the forums or something with kind of like tearing off a band-aid like this is something that needs to be done and it really hurts but i think it in the long run, it could be for the best. Because here's the thing, Sega Sammy, they're not going to be making the decisions to fuck us over and make us even have have even worse games. They are doing this because things got so bad. You know? Exactly. I mean, if we were sitting here going like, why are they losing money? I mean, look <laughs> at all these great games. Now, it's like, I think, I think it would be a total different kind of story here, but it's like when you, I don't know, it's kind of hard to see what I mean, what behind I mean, what was going behind the scenes yeah. for this decision, and uh, so it's hard to tell. But from a standpoint of a gamer, I mean, to me, the software kind of speaks for itself. There, the package titles. Yeah, I mean, we've got to. I, I mean, I personally, I have to remove some of that, you know, because you and I we're so close to Sega of America in terms of the people we know. I mean, we've, I at least I don't know, I've met people who made games that, you know, I've played. And as much as I like those people, I didn't really like the games that much. I mean, I'm not an asshole. I'm not going to say, oh, your game fucking sucks. Because I did find enjoyment, you know, in them. But like we were saying... Yeah, Facebook comments are there. Yeah, I mean, if you were to say to me, Barry, do you did you absolutely love any of Sega of America's package titles? I'd, I'd be like, eh, I like Shinobi 3DS. Uh... That was pretty good. That was pretty good. But, you know, this is... If if we were sitting here and we were going, why the fuck are they doing this? We just played ten awesome Sega of America games in the last few years, but we haven't. I agree there. Um, there, I think there's weird... There's a weird thing. I don't know. Sega needs to figure itself out. And it's also... I don't understand. Are they going to start doing more classic IPs considering that they want to license the IPs to other companies? I mean, wouldn't this actually be a positive for fans? Like, well, that's the thing. Like, you're, yeah, you're I mean, bringing in, you're bringing in traffic for your old IPs. I mean, that sounds good to old fans that you haven't done anything. With. I mean, with these IPs, you haven't done shit with. You never know. I mean, I've speculated that they could. In you, you, I don't know if you were a fan of this uh, concept, but they could be making TV shows and movies of classic Sega IPs, and then people are like, 
oh man, I gotta try those old games. Where's the new games? And they start releasing new games. Like it could work that way. You never know. It could. It, I mean, it could work that way as long as they don't take the steps that they did with Sonic Boom there. That's but, true. With the game, but, uh, if, if they if they get, the, I would love them to start doing. Just get the Japanese guys that made the games, or like at least have a Japanese team do it. I mean, if you're gonna make a game about of Streets of Rage, try to get the same, you know, the same guy that did the music for what is his name? Oh, no. Yuzo, whatever. <laughs> oh yeah, Yuzo Koshiro. Yeah, have him make the music. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's he's doing Atlas music. It's not that hard. Just go across the street and get him. Well, yeah, and you look at um uh. Crazy Taxi City Rush, you know, it's not a big title, but they got the uh, creator of Crazy Taxi on board, and I think that worked in its favor. It gave it a lot more, uh, you know, it's not a main series title, but I would look at Crazy Taxi City Rush as a much better title than the Game Boy Advance release. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it was a de- it was a decent title for what it was. I yeah. mean, let's be honest, cell phones are very limited in controls, and I felt that that one was pretty good, I mean, for what they were trying to go with. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and th- and this last bit too with uh, Sonic. I know we mentioned it, but look at look at what they're saying with this. The Sonic and merchandising business will be reinforced to establish a structure which can de- generate stable profits. This is basically saying that as of now, up till now, the Sonic and the merchandising business has not been generating stable process profits. It's been very unstable, and uh, I think that instability stems largely from Sonic Boom. Um. And well, well, I mean, I'm trying to think of it. It's like I also think they haven't used mm, the franchise. I mean, I think it's like you randomly have games fail. I mean, I don't know how well Boom sold, but I doubt it's going to break a million. No, and it's and it's just like I don't know. It's kind of hard to have a friend. I'm surprised that people that Sonic is still as big as it is with all the blunders they've done with it. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, like Sonic goes Sonic six. It and it's. But they have done. I mean, they have improved, and I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I mean, but what do you think about that? What do you think it reinforced means? I think reinforced means to make it a stable brand, so that they don't go on this roller coaster ride anymore. Yeah, do you think Boom is not coming back? Um, I I can see the TV series running its course. There's 52 episodes, and they've been only releasing one a week, so we're going to be seeing that throughout 2015. Um, the comic book will continue at least through the Mega Man crossover because they've already started work on that. So I could see the comic book going up to maybe 12 issues. Um, the toys, I have not been to a toy store in like a year. Um, but, um, I hear they're still in stores. Um, but yeah, the games, no one talks about those anymore. I, I'm pretty, I think, uh, I, I know that a lot of people like the, the cartoon. The cartoon's been a uh, very, uh, positively uh taken so i mean i think that's a good sign i mean at least for the future of other sega ips getting this kind of treatment because i just hope they don't just do every single thing as a comedy like oh let's just follow the sonic boom formula let's all make a comedy yeah that's true i know yeah i mean i could see them doing some more like uh teen teen maybe uh focused uh, CG animated shows with some of their things, like maybe a Golden Axe or something. I don't know. We'll have to see. But <laughs> uh, let's, yeah. uh, looking back at this PDF, there's one more bit here. It's the future outlook. And uh, they say the group is currently assessing the impact on full-year consolidated operating results forecast for the year ending March 31st, 2015, from affirmated structure reform measures implemented in SEGA. Uh, the group is taking initiatives for structure reform, including s- soliciting voluntary retirement at several group companies in addition to the aforementioned measures implemented at SEGA. They like saying a lot of the same things again and again. Uh, yeah. The number solicited for voluntary retirement and such for the entire group, this is all of SEGA all over the world, is scheduled to be around 300 regular employees. And the early retirement benefit is expected as a result of this measure. The group also plans to right-size employees, including fixed-term employees. In addition to the aforementioned laser, uh, labor costs reduction, the group is taking measures such as implementing actions for enhancing efficiency in domestic and overseas businesses. So they're basically saying that these changes that they're making, they will assess if they have been working. And uh, <laughs> so they fired, th- they fired 300 people. Yeah. Or they will, uh, by March 31st, 300 people will have gone. Because we have learned that a few people are staying on for a few months. 
Um, I mean, Stephen Frost had said that he's on for a bit more, at least through March 31st, it looks like here. Um, I know, you know, we know that uh, Kelly and Julian are leaving. The only thing is we don't know if they did not want to move or if they were be told to voluntarily retire. And I think just between uh, you and I, that might be one of our bigger concerns is if Sega of America is truly going, doing away with their community team, which would be a, yeah. which would be really bad. I think, <laughs> I think it would suck. I mean, they, I mean, they run everything for say, I mean, at least for anything that, that has fan contact. Oh yeah. I mean, they, they, they do them usually. They, they need someone to run the Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram, um, to work with fan sites. I mean, if they honestly are going to be, cause I know Europe got rid of, uh, that, but, um, Kelly and Julian were covering Europe as well. Yeah, they were doing, yeah. So my hope is, is that they didn't want to move. I know that both of them combined had been with the company for nearly 20 years. Um, so, yeah. you know, that's one of the things we'll have to wait and see. Uh, that's the one I'm most concerned about, just as someone who r- helps run a fan site. It's also the 300 employees. I mean, uh, Sega supposedly, according to Wikipedia, uh, employs what well, has employment of 2,226 2, people. And I'm assuming this is just Sega Sammy without, uh, without all the other. Uh, oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, so this is like Atlas is still doing their thing. They employ a large number of people, and it's um, – so you take away 300, and it's like you're basically under 2,000 people. That's kind of uh, – I think that's still a little low for mm-hmm. a company that size. But, I mean, what do you think about that? Um, well, like, you, you know, it's – it might just be kind of the new frontier for game companies that with the, with digital, with PC comes less – need for less people. Uh, it's unfortunate, but um, and it also could mean that moving forward, because I, I remember and I can't find the quote right now, but following this release, um, one of the uh, head honchos at Sega said that his hope is that this works out and then they can start rebuilding again. And I, I definitely think their plan in the long term is to have things at Sega of America start improving again and they will begin to build the company back up with people that they need. Uh, yeah. Especially with the Hollywood initiative. If that gets off the ground, can you imagine right now we have Sonic brand managers and then we have general brand managers. Can you imagine if there was a Sonic brand manager, a Shinobi brand manager, a streets of rage brand manager. And uh, uh, this is something I've actually noticed about this. More American companies are, uh, I guess you could say more stacked with employees. I was just looking at this. Okay, Nintendo has over 5,000 employees, which is you know their console maker. They have a lot of in-house games, but it's still not. It's like double what Sega has. Yeah. EA has 9,000, over 9,000 employees. Wow. That's like insane. They don't even make consoles. What are you guys doing? What is going on here? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it kind of gives you a perspective of kind of where. Uh, Sega is, I guess. If you want another perspective, too, this is pretty wild. Uh, Atlas, do you know how many people they employ? I know they're owned by uh, um, a larger group, but it says here Atlas, uh, as of April 2014, had 121 people. And they make some of the, what people consider some of the nicest RPGs out there, I guess. I mean, the other, they they make, you could tell when you play their game that they're really low budget. Mm Mm-hmm. But you could tell they put so much uh, effort into what they do have that it's just nice, nice games, and I'm sure they make a, a lot of profit on those games. Uh, and also to, to Index Corp, which owns Atlas, which is owned by Sega, they have 166 people. So really, these layoffs are the equivalent of laying off all of Atlas and Index. So if you can make it sound worse now, I well, think. I, you know, it's I guess it's just all perspective. You you look you look at what Atlas and Index can do with 300 people, and yeah. uh, you know you look at their output, and then you look at uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just, I don't know what I'm saying, but 300. I think I think <laughs> a lot of it is also Sega looking at the way Atlas was off of niche titles like 
Persona or like um, even little smaller ones. What's that thing called? The the one with the, the always release that never the dungeon crawler one. Oh right. What is that? Don't, I don't even remember the name. But that that game sells like five, like ten thousand units or something, dude. I swear it sells it sells it sells so little in America. Is it Etrian but yeah, Odyssey? It every single game. Huh? Etrian Odyssey. Yeah, that one. It's like I don't know how they even afford. It. I think some of them did twenty thousand ish. But it's like I think there's some some part of Sega that's like, yeah, we kind of want that those that kind of success where we could release a game with very few employees and make a profit out of it. Yeah. Instead of being a you know complete failure. Well, look at um, uh, Sega of America when they were at their peak of releasing uh, box titles on their own. We had a couple Marvel titles a year. We had. Um, a few external ones like the uh, uh, Alpha Protocol. So I guess you could say that um, even when you just take into account that uh, those 300 people being laid off from Sega, some of them are from the arcade division. I'm sure if you just take the Sega of America people, d- didn't they say too that a majority were from the arcade division? I've heard the same thing too, but it's hard to tell. It doesn't really say percentages. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to be that. Precise on so the, if uh, we're looking, if it if that is true, I mean that might just be a rumor. But if we're looking at less than 150 people being let go from Sega of America, um, and you look at their boxed game output, and then you look at what Atlas outputs with 121 people, maybe that puts it in a little more perspective. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I, I like a feeling inside me tells me that they kind of want to use the staff of analysts and just have them release everything for them. Yeah. But uh, I I don't know if that's even a good thing or a bad thing. But I mean we'll never know. I mean they're all about uh what do they call it uh be more efficient with what they got. Mm-hmm. And I think just pretty much having analysts handle it under Sega like not you know not being the same company or you know, they have their atlas thing. So we'll, I don't know. It probably, it probably won't be a good thing. I don't know. So to what do you th- well to here to wrap up this news discussion, let's let's. I want to ask you, what would you say if someone asked you? Oh, I heard some heard something's going on at Sega. What's going on? In the most concise way, how would you explain what we've, what's happening now, and what you think it's leading towards in the future? Sega, uh, Sega, Sammy have finally cut down on uh, Sega of America releasing un uh, popular products that get bad ratings and uh, nobody likes. And uh, I mean, they're trying to be more efficient and save it. I guess. I mean, we it's been years. I mean, like you said, it was like five years ago that uh, that uh, Alpha Protocol came out, and it's like they haven't really done a game that was 100 percent triple a perfect you know in a long so, time yeah so it's like they've been giving them chances and this is just something that they had to do i think and i'm surprised they haven't done it sooner that's good that works for me i i would uh definitely say the same thing i'd say that um this is something you know sega of america this Mainly, from what we know, this mainly impacts the games that they themselves have uh, uh, funded, have uh, uh, spearheaded, and like you said, a majority of those games were not good. A lot of them were uh, deals made with uh, external licensed IPs, with external developers, and there were... God, were any internally developed? I can't think of any. Big Red Button, Shinobi 3DS was external, really... It was uh, it was actually it kind of reminds me of how what Lucas Arts is now, where they have peop- a few people on staff who basically consult with these external companies on internal brands. Um, and but it's it's also even more than that. I mean, even when they when Sega was giving them money to purchase teams like Secret Level yeah. compared to like Creative Assembly for sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, when when I made my uh, did that developer retrospective article i noticed that secret level was the only one really that has gone away and you look at what they made so like you said it's been a long time coming uh it really sucks for the people we know we really hope that they uh, land on their feet find great jobs and i know they will given how great they've been to us in the past um but i also hope moving forward in the future that uh these changes uh positively affect the company 
Um, I think at this moment they do not negatively impact us because, like you said, there hasn't been any good Sega of America games. So we're not losing. We're not missing out on anything outside of maybe another Sonic Boom and Golden Compass 2 or something like that. Um, uh, so it's uh, it's. I think it's going to be an interesting next couple of years for Sega of America, and I hope that it uh, is a positive one. I also hope that they don't cut fan relations. That would be a really bad move on their part. And, um, you know, I'm not one to start uh, campaigns, but fuck, you know, like if they seriously think that uh, becoming an, uh, as bad as uh, some other American developers that I know of who just have zero fan relations, <laughs> Nintendo, uh, you know, that would that would be awful, I think, for the community. I think so, too. But we will have to find out during, what, summer, I guess? Yeah, it's going to be a very interesting summer for sure. So. And it is the, we're going to hit the, 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 the music button right here? <laughs> well, I will say, Segabits, we are not, uh, we're in fact hiring, if anything. We're not uh, downsizing. So. We're, yeah, we're downsizing. Yeah, we are. We're <laughs> only going to post the Sonic News. We are we downsizing. We're downsizing. We're looking to replace some things, obviously. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but hey, that wraps up our 75th show. Uh, we had a great interview with uh, Lisa Wilkerson, and uh, we had a uh, great chat with the uh, creator of Sega Pits, Mr. Uh, Mr. George. Well, bye. <laughs> that works. <laughs>